Hello listeners. Welcome to Itihasa, a Indic history podcast. And you're listening to episode 17 of this season Vijayanagara. This is the sixth installment in the foundation series of this season. In the last episode, Sangama Rahasya, we started unraveling the mystery around the Sangama brothers and explored various narratives surrounding them. In this episode, we will pick up where we left last time. We had concluded the last episode with three main points. The first being that the Telugu origin theory about the founders was mostly an after the fact concoction. The next, the Sangama brothers getting converted to Islam and then having a fantastical garvapsi too was mostly a false propaganda. And it most probably was cooked up by the Bijapuri court historians at that time. And finally, the Sangama brothers most probably had no whatsoever connection with either Kampali or Kakatiya or royal family bloodlines. In this episode, we will explore in depth about Sangamas, their rise and how they ended up forging an empire at a critical time when Hindus were cornered all over the country and had no other choice but to fight back against the onslaught of Delhi Sultanate on one end and the Madurai Sultanate on the other. We will mainly try to understand how Harihara and Bukka burst onto the scene which was already being dominated by powerful forces like Veera Bhallala of Hoysala in South and the Tughlaq Sultanate in the Deccan in the rest of India. We will start the story with a quick snapshot of the political landscape of India as of 1328 AD. In the north, the Tughlaq Sultanate under Muhammad bin Tughlaq had subjugated most of it, leaving a long trail of death and destruction. In the Deccan and south, Tughlaqs had subjugated the kingdoms of Yadavas, Kakatiyas, Pandyas and the tiny kingdom of Kampili. The incessant Islamic onslaught against them, starting with Khiljis and the Tughlaqs, had left the four kingdoms in complete ruins and effectively wiping them off the map. And the only part of India that probably wasn't under the direct subjugation of Islamic Sultanate as of 1328 AD was Orissa under the Gajapatis. So in the Deccan and South, with the fall of Yadavas, Kakatiyas, Pandyas and Kampili, the last standing ones were the Hoysalas. And as we saw in the previous episodes, Veera Bhallala III had chosen to submit to the Tughlaqs for now, lay low by playing along as a subservient vassal and stay alive to fight another day. We saw earlier how Tiruvannamalai became the new capital of Hoysalas after the fall of Dwara Samudra in the initial onslaught of Khiljis and Tughlaqs, after which it gradually lost its political importance but still retained its overall strategic importance as a forward base from a military perspective. We also saw in one of the previous episodes, Bharlala had decided to spread out his residences and members of his administration across various strategic places in the south to better protect against Islamic attacks. Let's now once again look at the beautiful inscription from Chitaladurga Taluk, modern day Chitradurga district in Karnataka that records the names of all those who attended this important convention headed by Veera Bhallala in the deep interiors of Unnamale or also known as Tiruvannamale that is located in the modern day Tamil Nadu. Quote, in 1328 AD, when the Hoysana strong armed Veera Bhallala Deva, together with the champion at his side, the strong armed Bhima Raya, the Prince Kathorahara, the Prince Veera Simhara Gunada, the Prince Kalamecha, the Prince Veera Santa, Baicheya the Nanayaka, Kampuva, who was a punisher of the famous Mahadava Raya of Udavara, the great minister Ballappa the Nanayaka, the great minister Singaya the Nanayaka, were in the residence of the city of Unnamale, ruling the kingdom in peace and wisdom. Unquote. There are two names of interest here mainly, Ballappa the Nanayaka and Kathorahara. 
we already saw that ballappa was a right hand man and nephew of veera bhallala so who is kathora hara as per the legendary kannada historian sakleshpur sri kantaya in his epic work founders of vijayanagara kathora hara here is hari hara one of the founders of vijayanagara logically the question that arises now is what was hari hara doing in that meeting with veera bhallala and many other important figures why was he invited to it in what capacity was he there and what was his connection with hoysalas to go about understanding or decoding this mystery just sifting through mountains of research inscriptions conflicting chronicle accounts or village kaifiyats isn't enough one needs to have a guiding framework to make sense of the evidence at hand in a coherent manner the lens or the framework we employ should be able to help us spot patterns that keep repeating these patterns in my opinion are the key to decoding mysteries like this and then we can use these patterns to categorize and rate a supposed piece of evidence based on plausibility and possibilities empires and ant hills follow some set patterns that are unique to them both of them rise and fall meticulously in tune with their life cycles when it comes to vijayanagara origin studies what i've noticed is in most cases there are islands of fabulous research but they're not exactly fully connected for example let's take henry harris's beginnings of vijayanagara ramanayya's work kampali and vijayanagara paul coelho's work hoysala vamsa and finally sri kantaya's founders of vijayanagara what is the common thread among all of them like we saw in the last foundation episode that common thread is not just the obvious identity and origin of the founders of vijayanagara but also the connection of these founders with the rest of the players in the geopolitical and religious landscape if you observe each of these works is giving a certain theory or version of the connection as they saw it the scholars are most of the times cross referencing sources debunking some and confirming some using either hard evidence like period inscriptions or at times using plain common sense but again if you notice there is no clear framework that allows them to look at the three sources or any other source other than using brute force comparison and verification i think sri kantaya's work comes really close to doing that and indeed is a fine piece of work and this is where i personally propose dr m bosu babu's analysis on centralized power structures in his fantastic work material background to vijayanagara empire published in 2018 it's a really nice lens with which to look at this problem it has the advantage of being backed by latest research that can glean a lot more insights in hindsight the key in solving the origin problem isn't always more data and more inscriptions that is almost very hard to come by and at times there is a genuine case of forgery and propaganda even with the inscriptions so we will look at dr m bose babu's theory in a bit we also have mountains of research manuscripts chronicles and inscriptions but sometimes i feel less is more especially when there is an information overload it might sound counterintuitive but it's a fact that many a times what we need is new patterns and lenses to apply on the same data to glean better insights a good analogy is the game of chess there might be eight legal moves on the board for a particular turn but there might be only two candidate moves and there usually will be one best move so the key to picking the best move ultimately comes down to your ability to spot repeating patterns and training your reflexes and discarding the bad moves without wasting time and finally focusing your time and energy instead on the two candidate moves to help you make that decision 
it's a similar problem we are trying to solve here too we have all these sources accounts legends and theories about the origins of the sangamas which we have to filter and settle on one coherent one in the last foundation episode we looked at different narratives around harihara and bukka if you observed we were trying to find the point of origin by trying to see if sangamas fit into kakatiyas kampili hoysala or yadava connection narrative and then we are attempting to find the truth in each narrative instead of doing that we ought to flip the approach we took earlier on its head and embrace what we call neti neti approach it's a method for inquiry which is very popular with advaita vedantas where they instead try to find what is false first and by the process of elimination they arrive at what is actually true we will employ this method of inquiry along with dr m bose babu's theory to help us rule out all the bad narratives based on their proximity to the theory and then zero in on the best plausible one this in my opinion will prevent us from mistaking a few trees for a forest now let's look at dr bose babu's theory quickly if you remember from the first installment of the foundation series the four kingdoms we had discussed his analysis on centralized power structures in the context of kakatiyas we had looked at their strengths weaknesses and some unique self repeating patterns in such a power structure in short what this analysis points to is all the four kingdoms shared a common pattern which was they all had a centralized power structure wherein the emperor or the monarch was a suzerain to all the vassals who were submitted to him the emperor and vassals were in strange yet dynamic relationship the strength of centralized power structures depended on the support of the subordinate local nayakas or chiefs that ruled over distant parts of it it was not an easy task to keep them always under control and the emperor at the center was often forced to project his military power in order to control them through fear or through rewards of loyalty this meant that the emperor used to undertake frequent military expeditions over neighboring powers and also lead the armies against rebellious chieftains while this had the intended effect on the rebellious chieftains making them fall in line this had an unintended effect too for the emperor the loyal chiefs who used to accompany the emperor in these expeditions were further elevated in their political importance and increase in their influence this gradually led to a rise in their own ambitions and set them up to rise against a monarch at an opportune moment as we saw in the beginning the opportune moment most of the times tends to be during the decline of an empire this whole analysis only goes to suggest that the political order was predominantly local and fortunes of the centralized power structures or the monarchy at the center were completely locked into them the central power structures of the empires were primarily interested in only extending their realms to keep increasing their revenues with the political weapon of annexation the political and cultural integration of the empire wasn't really a priority or of importance to them exceptions to this political behavior was very rare but it did happen like we will see further in the episode and this meant that the monarchy at the center gave a free hand to their vassal states to manage their own affairs autonomously with least interference in their internal matters of course as long as they chose to remain loyal keep contributing to royal coffers and send their share of men and arms to the empire's army this then meant that there would always be these centrifugal forces within the empire's provinces which were always at odds with the centripetal forces of the empire 
now that we understood what our guiding framework would be let's do a quick recap of the starting point of our story in 1328 AD after the fall of Kampili Hoysalas were the last ones standing among the ruins of South and Deccan they were badly wounded and submitted to Tughlaqs but still standing albeit as an independent kingdom Tughlaqs had effectively buried Kakatiyas, Yadavas, Pandyas and Kampili. With this, we can say a few things very confidently, which is that all the old rivals of Hoysalas were wiped out by Tughlaqs. And Tughlaqs' reach in 1328 AD was up until the gates of Hoysala, Dwara Samudra. And everything down from there was under the direct influence of Hoysalas and indirect influence of Tughlaqs. And as we saw earlier, Veera Bhalala had every intention to rebuild his army and defense posture before attempting a bold offensive against the Tughlaqs by coordinating with the remnants of the broken up Kakatiya and Yadava kingdoms in the Deccan. In short, there were two major powers in the south, the Tughlaqs and the Hoysalas. And Veera Bhalala was still a force to reckon with and very much in the game. With that in perspective, we can now look at the Sankama brothers and see how they fit into this overall political landscape. We already know that there was a sort of peace between the Tughlaqs and Hoysalas after Veera Bhalala accepted the Tughlaq domination. While in the regular narratives it is said that the Vijayanagar empire's foundation was laid in the year 1336 AD, But in reality, it was not until 1346 AD that the eldest of the Sangama brothers, Harihara, was officially proclaimed as a ruler of the entire Karnatic, coast to coast and beyond. Barring the areas under Madurai Sultanate, most of the territories came under Vijayanagara in the south only after 1346 AD. It was only after 1378 AD that the entire of south came under the hegemony of vijayanagara empire it was the brave military campaigns of kumara kampanna which ended up defeating the madurai sultanate and bringing it down we had touched this topic briefly in episode 8 if you remember assuming the foundations of the vijayanagara empire were laid in 1336 ad by harihara and bukka The crucial question to ask is why did Harihara take 10 years to announce Vijayanagara's overlordship of the entire south and Karnatic what or who was stopping him from doing that and how was Harihara able to establish himself and Vijayanagara's hegemony strongly in the Karnatic and south when Veera Bhallala was already a force to reckon with there Were Harihara and Bukka the vassals of the Tughlaqs who then helped the Sangama brothers to overthrow the Hoysalas and take their place like some narratives claim? These are the questions that we need to answer. This is why working backwards in the story works really well in deciphering the mystery behind the rise of Sangamas. Let's try to see how plausible the narrative of Sangama brothers being the vassals of Tughlaqs is. So in a country devastated by continuous war extending over a long period, it could not be expected that Harihara and Bukka would be able to raise an independent army of their own. Nor did they have the immense wealth to raise such an army. And even if we assume the Sangama brothers were indeed vassals of the Tughlaqs, then there should be some sort of evidence of skirmishes and encounters and battles between them and Veera Bhallala after 1328 AD and there should also have been evidence of the Sangama brothers paying tribute to the Tughlaqs as vassals just like Veera Bhallala did now this brings up yet another interesting question if Veera Bhallala had already voluntarily submitted to Tughlaq after the fall of Kampili why would Muhammad bin Tughlaq send the obscure Sangama brothers against his own powerful vassal 
and why would he try to kill the goose then gave him an annual tribute the tugluks desperately needed to finance their armies and wars all over the country and last but not least why would the tugluk sultan send an upstart vassal like sangamas to crush the powerful hoysalas instead of leading the army against hoysalas himself and we know from the earlier chitradurga inscription on the meeting the tugluks were planning to subdue the south once and for all themselves even if one blindly assumes that the sangama brothers were vassals who took help from tugluks to crush hoysalas why weren't the hoysala territories then annexed by tugluks and why wasn't bhallala captured instead we see him left to his own devices if they indeed were tugluk vassals then the whole narrative of bijayanagara being founded on the premise of being a bulwark against the islamic onslaught will crash land on the ground but then there is no evidence of any such tugluk sangama connection the more one thinks about this the less it makes sense things just don't add up i think one can safely conclude that this theory of sangama brothers being tugluk vassals doesn't hold ground and is highly improbable and even if we for a minute assume yet another narrative that the sangama brothers had some connection with kampili and waged war against kampili's arch rivals the hoysalas without tugluk help i wonder how that would be even possible with the kakatiyas yadavas and pandyas all biting the dust prior to kampili Sangama brothers had no whatsoever help from any of those regions which were already swallowed up by the Tugluks. This leaves only one logical option for the Sangama brothers. Either they were forced to ally with the Hoysalas under Veera Bhallala or they have been always a willing and friendly vassal of Hoysalas. Now let's try to solve the mystery of the character called Deorao that we saw in the last episode. This character was first described by the Portuguese chronicler Fernão Nunes in his accounts on the foundation of Vijayanagara after the fall of Kampili. Nunes describes the new Hindu king of Bijanagar as Devarao, who was originally imprisoned by the Delhi Sultan and then set free by him and who thereafter returned to the country. Robert Seville in his classic The Forgotten Empire describes Dev Rao or also Devaraya as a general title of the Vijayanagara kings while it's true today that Devaraya was a general title of the Vijayanagara emperors but in the context of the founders neither Harihara nor Abukka were ever referred to or assumed such a title during their existence the legendary kannada historian sri kantaya makes a daring claim that the devarao or devaraya was instead the hoysala monarch veera bhallala as bhallala was also called as veera bhallala devarasa or also known as veera bhallala devaraya we saw in one of the previous episodes blood of the last hoysala how bhallala was at one point taken to delhi by the delhi sultanate rulers after he submitted initially and then sent back along with his son in dwara samudra shri kantaya is confident that the devarao and bhallala are the same person even more so because bhallala at that point was the sole remaining independent hoysala ruler and vassal of tugluks he was the one who knew the region of anugundi kampili and the north of karnataka areas closer to hampi or vijayanagara like back of his hand considering the hoysala proximity to those domains and also with hoysala arch rival kampali's fall hoysalas were the natural choice of tugluks to fill the power vacuum down south and bring an end to the chaos since it was clear that tugluk rule was thoroughly rejected by the populace in that region if tugluks had to milk the region for the tributes and its wealth the only option left to them was to rule it by proxy 
and who better proxy than Veera Bhallala, who had earlier submitted as a vassal to the Tughlaqs for a temporary respite and to rebuild Hoysala's strength. This narrative or the theory is so compelling, both from hard evidence and circumstantial evidence standpoint, that all the other narratives we saw in the previous episodes totally pale in front of it. Now that we established the identity of the mysterious character of Dev Rao and how the Tughlaqs were forced to take the help of Dev Rao alias Veera Bhallala to restore order to the troubled region. It becomes easier to understand not just the relation of Hoysalas with Sangamas but also the foundation of the city of Vijayanagara. First, let's look at the story of the city of Vijayanagara. The usual narrative that you'll read in every blog or pop history book out there is that Vijayanagara was originally established near the banks of Tungabhadra by the Sangama brothers Harihara and Bukka with the help of the Sringeri Mathas head Vidyaranya as a bulwark against the Islamic onslaught. While surely the city of Vijayanagara was indeed established to act as a bulwark against the Islamic onslaught into the south and the overall research or evidence also concedes that Harihara had nominated his talented brother Bukka to expand the city and fully fortify it after 1346 AD. And it is said Bukka finished the fortification within seven years at a rapid pace. But the question here is, did the Sangama brothers actually break the ground and establish the city? And this is where both the recorded and the circumstantial evidence overwhelmingly point to Veera Bhallala instead. Here is an excerpt from the 16th century Bijapuri court chronicler Farishta on this matter. Quote, Bilal Dev convened a meeting of his kinsmen and resolved first to secure the forts of his own country and then to remove the seat of his government to the mountains. He then built a strong city on the frontiers of his domain and called it after his son Bija, to which the word Nagar or city was added so that it is now known by the name of Bijanagar." Unquote. Sri Kantaya claims that Farishta was in an exceptional position to obtain information regarding this matter in Bijapur. Partly thanks to the Adil Shahi obsession with keeping meticulous archives records in the royal libraries. Also the tradition of naming the cities in such a way was still alive during the 16th century too. The excerpt as such is interesting. The first half of it refers to the grand meeting convened by Bhallala in Trivannamale, which we already saw earlier in the episode. The next half is of our interest now. It talks about Bhallala building a strong city on the frontiers of his domain and naming it after his son. If one looks at the political situation back then, it becomes evident the Tughlaqs made Bhallala a proxy ruler of the region that used to be earlier Kampili's domains. And Bhallala took over the area of modern-day Hampi and started bolstering it as a strong buffer for the Hoysala domains in anticipation of future attacks by Tughlaqs, that is whenever the peace between both of them broke down. Another smoking gun proof of Veera Bhallala Founding the city of Vijayanagara is the coronation of his son Veera Virupaksha Ballala Deva as a crown prince in this newly founded city, which was also known as Sri Veera Vijaya Virupaksha Pura. The name clearly coincides with that of Ballala's son. Also, Ballala used it as one of his capitals and on and off residence and it's recorded that he was in the city even as late as 1339 AD. If you remember, I had mentioned earlier in the episode that the foundation of the Vijayanagara Empire was laid by Sangama brothers in the year 1336 AD. But here we see Veera Bhallala founding the city of modern-day Hampi and controlling it even as late as 1339 AD. 
So listeners might be wondering what the hell is going on here. Let's quickly recap the important years from all the previous foundation episodes to understand what is actually going on. Before 1328 AD, we saw fall of Kakatiyas, Yadavas and Pandyas. Hoysalas escaped destruction unlike their rivals and contemporaries by submitting to Khiljis. 1328 AD, fall of Kampili. Hoysalas surrendered Bahauddin Gharshasp and escaped the Tughlaq Rath. They accept their supremacy. Veera Bhallala starts strengthening his empire and forms alliances with Andhra Desa and Telangana chieftains. Post 1328 AD Rebellions in the south against Tughlaqs. So they use Hoysalas as a proxy to placate the region. Veera Bhallala builds a fort in modern day Hampi. 1335 AD Establishment of Madurai Sultanate in Mabar region after a palace coup against Tughlaqs. 1336 AD Foundation of Vijayanagara Empire laid down by Sangama brothers Harihara and Bukka. 1339 AD Veera Bhallala uses Vijayanagara as one of his capitals and residences with Tiruvannamalai being his main capital. His son Veera Virupaksha Bhallala Deva is crowned as the next heir in modern day Hampi. 1342 AD Veera Bhallala fights against the Madurai Sultanate and dies in the battle of Kandanur Koppam. 1343 AD Veera Bhallala's son is crowned as the next Hoysala monarch and officially the end of Hoysalas was that year. 1346 AD The eldest of Sangama brothers Harihara officially assumes the title of ruler of both the coast and an empire is truly born. When one looks at this timeline it's clear that the Sangama brothers immediately after the death of Veera Bhallala the 3rd became a major power in the region that effectively taken over the mantle from Veera Bhallala. Bhallala's son's rule is not even worth talking about as his coronation was a mere token incident and ceremonial at the best. The real interesting part that raises the eyebrows as an historian is the fact that the transition seems to have been a bloodless one. And this is usually a rarity in the medieval times. And this minor detail tells volumes about the relation of Hoysalas and Sangamas. Remember, this wasn't a palace coup either. It was a calm and orderly transfer of power. The lack of inscriptions or records till date showing any sort of battle or skirmishes between Hoysalas and Sangama brothers is a strong evidence of Sangamas being on friendly terms with the Hoysalas. Whereas we have many records of Hoysala wars with the Tughlaqs and the Madurai Sultanate. All of this makes us come to the conclusion that the Sangama brothers were vassals of the Hoysalas and that they were in the right place in time to fill in the power vacuum created by the death of their suzerain Veera Bhallala III. And this is where the research and theory proposed by Dr. M. Bosu Babu on the centralized power structures that we saw earlier fits in nicely and allows us to use it as a lens. So when looking at the rise of Sangamas through this lens, we get to see the Sangamas fitting perfectly into the mold of powerful yet loyal vassals to the royal house of Hoysalas. And being in such a powerful and enviable position, they would have been in a perfect spot to assume the reins of power after the death of Veera Bhallala III. The Sangamas would have consolidated their own position and power in the Hoysala power structures through their loyalty to Veera Bhallala, just like how we saw a few such examples and their patterns in the Four Kingdoms episode. If listeners recollect, in one of the previous foundation episodes, Blood of the Last Hoysala, I told you how Bhallala delegated some of his administrative powers to his vassals, ministers and feudatories 
in exchange for steadfast loyalty and running the kingdom smoothly which then enabled barlala to focus on his long term strategy of an offensive defensive against the tughlaqs up north and madurai sultanate down in mabar region so in this enterprise veera barlala had assigned the responsibility for the defense of northern provinces to the sangama brothers especially to harihara another interesting thing that bharlala did was elevating harihara to the important position of a mahamandaleshwara in both the hoysala and later vijayanagara military and political structures the position of mahamandaleshwara involved being the prime nayaka who oversaw the other nayakas or chieftains or the vassals of the empire and yet another interesting thing is the famous historian reverend henry harris in his work early beginnings of vijayanagara claims that the responsibility of administering the old capital of hoysalas which was dwara samudra was assigned to hariharas brother bukka that was the level of trust barlala placed on sangamas and bukka was a fine administrator and he went to great lengths to take care of the people and the domains that were assigned to him and the hoysala citizens loved him the fact that harihara and bukka got promoted to such premier positions of power indicates how much bharlala trusted harihara and sangamas per se as vassals sangamas would have been expected to stand by bharlala loyally and faithfully and they indeed stood by bharlala till last reverend henry harris in his work beginnings of vijayanagara history published in 1929 presents a compelling theory backed by epigraphical evidence showing the close links between the family of sangamas and veera bharlala's grandfather in short he to hint strongly at the plausibility of sangamas being long time vassals of hoysalas with this understanding we can show how as of 1336 ad the sangama brothers were in no position to declare their own independence and there was also no need for them to prematurely do that especially when bharlala was handing them his empire and legacy on a silver platter all they had to do was to wait out the 80 plus year old bharlala to be fair i also have to point out the other narrative which claims bharlala and the sangama brothers weren't exactly on good terms and the proponents of this narrative show some skirmish with harihara and subsequent bharlala's visit to barakur fort in 1338 ad as a proof for that but this cannot be any farther from the truth in my opinion it is either a result of confusion or overzealousness in trying to prove a certain line of narrative with half baked facts we have an inscription from aladahalli arisikre taluk in hasan district that is dated to april 22nd 1338 ad which shows that veera bharlala was on a visit to his military establishments in barakuru the scholars trying to propagate this flawed theory of bharlala and harihara skirmishing forget one crucial detail which is barakuru in modern day udupi district of karnataka was at one point the capital city of the ancient and thousand year old alupa dynasty veera bharlala had married the alupan princess chikkaitai sometime around 1335 ad and also annexed it to the hoysala empire and bharlala also had set up a system of administration under able chief minister and his alupan queen chikkaitai to rule over this new territory as his proxy there was no disturbance to this setup even after veera bharlala's death in 1342 ad but then from where did this narrative of fight between harihara 
and Bhallala arise in first place. And is there a possibility there indeed was some tension between Bhallala and his powerful vassal Harihara and Bukka? Going by the past observed patterns among suzerains and their powerful vassals, there mostly would have been some tension at some point. But this is pretty much expected. The question that needs to be asked is, did that pattern follow yet another pattern of conflict between the suzerain and his vassal? If so, where is the evidence for the conflict? In many cases, there is abundance of such evidence. But in this case, there is none. Which is a very rare exception and for a good reason. In my opinion, what happened was, some events that transpired in between Bhallala's death in 1342 AD and Harihara's coronation in 1346 AD got juxtaposed onto each other and gave birth to a new narrative. While it's true that Harihara launched a blitzkrieg against the Alupan capital of Barakuru, it was in 1346 AD, which is four years after the death of Bhallala. Now that we dispel that flawed narrative and establish the closeness between Sangamas and Hoysalas, we can see how Harihara got elevated to such an important position and can imagine the implications of such a move by Bhallala. I am sure Bhallala himself was aware of it and in my personal opinion, it was a very calculated move on his part. With such a move, he not only kept his most powerful vassal faithful and indebted for his generosity, but also slowed down the inevitable implosion of Hoysalas. At least till Bhallala put in place a strong defense against yet another impending Islamic onslaught against his South India. With Sangama brothers bolstering the northern frontiers and provinces of Hoysala kingdom, they played a crucial role in defense of the South. And obviously, with such a heavy burden came both the risks and rewards. This is how the Sankama brothers were in the perfect position of defending the Vijayanagara city or known as Virupakshapura or Hosapattana during Bhallala's time. One interesting thing to note here is Bhallala's young nephew Ballappa Dhananayakya, who was also his powerful minister, married Harihara's daughter when Bhallala was very much alive. And it's very much possible this happened with Bhallala's covert or overt blessings. This also might have been part of Bhallala's plan to keep a powerful vassal like Harihara tied to him by marital alliance. These sort of things were very common in those days and served a very important purpose in the grand scheme of things. Normally, this is nothing to be surprised of or worth pointing out. But thanks to fantastical narratives around this whole origin topic, even details like these end up being eye-openers. The marriage of Ballappa Dhananayaka with Harihara's daughter effectively had announced to the entire Hoysala kingdom that Harihara was a sole contender who was waiting in the wings to gradually slip into Bhallala's shoes once he was gone. And this is exactly what happened after Bhallala's death. While Veera Bhallala's son Veera Virupaksha Bhallala or Veera Bhallala IV was coronated in 1343 AD, he was nothing more than a ceremonial head of the Hoysala kingdom that was silently disintegrating in favour of Harihara and Bukka, the Sangama brothers. After Veera Bhallala III died in the battle of Kananur Kupam, like we saw in the earlier episode, Harihara took over all the domains of his suzerain in a bloodless coup. No blood was spilled and it can be considered as one of the most peaceful transitions between two empires till date in India's history. This fact in itself makes the story all the more interesting. All the vassals and armies of Hoysalas melted away into Harihara's newly founded Vijayanagara Empire. 
it is as peaceful as it can get in an age when blood flowed freely all around clearly most of them knew which way the wind was blowing and most importantly barlala was successful in making them realize that it was extremely important to stay together to fight against islamic onslaught it is estimated that this ceremonial king or the son of veera bharlala the third veera virupaksha was over 60 years old as veera bharlala himself was in his mid to late 80s when he died so his son probably had a natural death we have a very interesting inscription from the sringeri jagir dated to march 9th 1346 ad as recorded in the b lewis Rice's Epigraphica Karnataka Volume 6 This inscription records Harihara and his entire entourage of very prominent nayakas and his loyalists visiting the Sringeri Matha to pay respects to its head guru Vidya Tirtha not to be confused with Vidyaranya In this inscription Harihara for the first time is described as a conqueror of land between the eastern and western oceans and it lists his entourage by name the ones in attendance are all the sangama brothers ballapad dananayaka who is harihara son in law and few other important ones it's also recorded that harihara made some generous grants to the brahmins of shringeri matha but the most important detail in this inscription is a reference to nine villages belonging to Kela Nadu and Santilage Nadu being granted as land and endowments to the Sringeri Matha. So what is special about these villages? These villages belong to the widowed Alupan queen of Veera Bhallala III. The implication being that Harihara's legitimization as a new power and overlord of the south had not only the blessings of bharlala's alupan queen chikkaitai but also the latter acknowledged the overlordship or the domination of the new vijayanagara rulers this also speaks volumes of alupan diplomacy that was a secret for their thousand plus years of survival and being in power in the udupi region in short the alupan provinces in the west coast of karnataka that earlier belonged to hoysalas now smoothly came under indirect control of vijayanagara harihara had launched a blitzkrieg march to the city of barakuru after the death of veera bhallala and smoothly took it over without any bloodshed from the alupan vassals It was very important Harihara did this because Barakuru and its neighboring Batkal were the two most important and lucrative ports on the western side of the empire. These ports we will see later in the season play a crucial role in the empire's journey and prosperity. But it's really interesting to observe that Harihara did not assume any special titles. until after veera bhallala's son and the newly crowned king died in 1346 ad harihara and bukka even as of 1355 ad were referred to as mahamandaleshwaras of prior hoysalas it was both an odd sign of loyalty to his earlier illustrious hoysala suzerain veera bhallala the third and also a way to appropriate the legacy of hoysalas it was towards building the legitimacy of the newly minted royal house of sangamas in the eyes of all the hoysala domains and its population let us compare the birudas of the two dynasties hoysala and the sangamas we shall see it to be very interesting indeed the hoysalas were descended of the yadu race and its great ornaments They were in fact ornaments of the Yadu Vamsa appraisers kings of the Yadukula and sons in the Yadava sky 
in the sky of the yadu kula the yadu family indeed it was yadu vamsa which became known as hoysala vamsa besides like these titles the pearl of the heroes of yadu vamsa boon lord of dwaravatipura maintainer of the orders of the old kings of hoysala nad the imprecatory verses in the inscriptions of both dynasties in kannada language are the same is it a coincidence that such royal birudas of these two dynasties are the same i don't think so in fact it was a very well calculated move on part of sangamas to appropriate the legacy of their suzerain hoysalas and the sangamas not only appropriate the hoysala legacy they even attempted to appropriate some of the legacy of chalukyas and even the kampili kings this can be observed in the coinage of the newly minted vijayanagara empire the royal emblem of the vijayanagara empire was very much matching to the emblems of chalukyas and the kampili kings we will look at this in detail in the future episodes but this is something to keep in mind so all of this certainly helped in a seamless transition of power from hoysalas to the vijayanagara this again fits nicely into the overall framework of the centralized power structure dynamics that we saw earlier and finally with the birth of the first vijayanagara royal dynasty under the house of sangamas and the foundation of the glorious vijayanagara empire we come to the end of this long episode and from here on the empire dons a mythical form of a gandabeerunda or a phoenix that rises up from the ashes of all the major kingdoms of the south and it will rise so fast and high for the next 200 plus years that it will become one of the most powerful rich and advanced hindu empires that india had ever seen in the next two foundation episodes we will look at the role of shringeri matha in the foundation of vijayanagara and we will also look at the birth of vijayanagara's arch rival the bahmani kingdom the bahmanis too were born from the same fires of destruction in the deccan just like their vijayanagara rivals in the south the foundation series would be incomplete without us exploring the birth of bahmani kingdom and also the contributions of shringeri matha or vidyaranya in the foundation of vijayanagara i sincerely hope the listeners enjoyed this episode and if you did please hit the subscribe button and leave a rating and a review wherever it is that you're listening a huge thank you for taking the time to listen to the show i hope to see you soon in the next episode till then this is narendra vikram your host and narrator signing off hope you have a great week ahead